Welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Kelly. Hey! Before we get started, we just wanted to remind you of a couple things. First of all, there's going to be a bunch of links in our description and show notes for every episode. They're going to be pretty much the same stuff every week. We're going to have links to our social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're going to have links to some of the resource material. Let's say you just bought a house. Bad news is, you're one step closer to becoming your parents. You'll proudly mow the lawn. Ask if anybody noticed you mowed the lawn. Tell people to stay off the lawn. Compare it to your neighbor's lawn. And complain about having to mow the lawn again. Good news is, it's easy to bundle home and auto through Progressive and save on your car insurance. Which, of course, will go right into the lawn. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discount not available in all states or situations. Bills for our research in case you want to look into the cases a little bit further. And also some links for resources to domestic violence support, mental health support, 12-step, child protective services, a bunch of stuff like that. So if you're interested in those resources, we always have those links in the show notes. We also have links to our Threadless which is, I always fuck it up, but I'm always going to try it until I get it right. It's like threadless.murderdictionary.com or the other way around. Go one of these days, (laughs) I'm going to nail it. Yeah, you got it. I just throw three (laughs) keywords into Google and it usually comes up. That's what I do for pretty much everything Everything. because I can't figure out how to do things without Google pretty much. Not at all. Yeah. So Google Threadless and Murder Dictionary (laughs) (laughs) or follow the link in our show notes. And then the other link that's going to be in there is to our Patreon. So Patreon gives you access to bonus episodes and some small merch items if you support us on Patreon. So we have, first of all, one thing to clarify for Patreon, which is this week they sent out an email, which I know freaked everyone out, where they were like, oh, we're adding on these service fees to whatever support amount that you're giving to the shows you watch or creators you support. And then quickly, everybody was like, hell motherfucking no. And <laughs> Taxes. <you> write, like, <laughs> including the, the podcasters were just like, well, we don't want our listeners to pay for that. You no. know, like so they quickly issued an apology and said they're not going to be adding those fees. So if you did get that email, we hope that you saw the second one apologizing where they said that's not going to be the case. So whatever you are, uh, what like level you are at Patreon right now is not going to change. It's going to be the same amount. They're not going to add a service fee or anything else like that. So that's the latest update. But if anything changes, I'll, I'll find out and give more info. Cool. Cool. So with that said, we wanted to thank a few more Patreon supporters for this week. We wanted to say thank you to Martha, Andy, and Jodes. Martha, Andy, and Jodes. Exactly. Got it. Jodes is I, I like, I know it's not Chodes, but I just feel like <laughs> I sound like that. So, you know, like one of those words yeah. was like, did she say Chodes? Chode came into my mind, but I didn't want to be the first one to <laughs> make a dick joke. Uh, I also want to know, do you think it's Martha Stewart? <gasps> oh my gosh, she loves us. She's going to bake us some like pretty little shit, some spun sugar top stuff. <laughs> Some pretty little fancy. Shit. <laughs> that's that that's she's what I like. Yeah. I like pretty little shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's my shit. So thank you again to Martha, Andy, and Jodes. Jodes, not Jodes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. If I was Jodes, I would get that on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's Jodes, not Chodes, okay, you guys? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so I think that's pretty much it, except for if you haven't like subscribed on iTunes, that would be great. Or left a review, that would be awesome as well. And 
If you haven't shouted us out on your Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or told anybody about that show, we would really appreciate that as well. We love it when we see that other people found our show through friends. We have a couple of people that are like friends and tag each other mm-hmm. on our stuff, and I love seeing that. So we just really appreciate the people that are spreading the word about the show. And if you haven't told anyone, we would appreciate that if you did so. Yeah. Cool. Spread us like the word of God. <laughs> I, that's not what I was thinking, no? but yeah, that too. Okay, go to your neighborhood corner and shout us out. Shout at your neighborhood elderly person. <laughs> Murder dictionary. <laughs> I don't know what a podcast even is, fella. Nana, you about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, millennial kid. <laughs> So, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for the links and stuff that you'll find in show notes. And then this week, we are on University Part 3. Cool? Part 2. (laughs) 2. Oh, and also, there's one of our friends, uh, Mixer Hyde, JV, uh, that we did an episode where he interviewed us. Oh, yeah. So he actually has a true crime podcast now, and he's doing university murders. What? So if you guys haven't heard of his show, it's Criminal Musings, and he's doing some university shows. It should be, I think, he told me, like, next week. So I'm going to get the promo for that and and um, play it at the end so that you guys can check out his show. So we love Mixer Hyde. So he, if you want to hear more university stuff, more co-ed killers, something like that, definitely check it out. Cool? Cool. And for this week, we've got another university case. You're doing a shoulder roll. Mm-hmm. and like it. Taking You're excited it about the... <laughs> <laughs> I should have got you a schoolgirl sh- skirt or something. It's underneath these jeans and big jacket. <laughs> I couldn't even tell. You don't even have like a skirt bulge or anything. I have a dare ruler. <laughs> you the do? only thing I kept from the D.A.R.E. program. <laughs> I always wanted one of the D.A.R.E. shirts. I knew it was super lame, but everybody that I knew that wore them was super stoners. So I was yeah. like, I need one of those. Of course. But, you know, I'm an adult now, so I just have no limits on buying my own shit, which is problematic <laughs> because then I go and buy things like that. Yeah. It's like, did I really need that D.A.R.E. shirt? Yes. Not so much. <laughs> but I wanted it in school, so... Now I can have it. So this week, we are going to talk about John Norman Collins. So John was the baby of the family, which is always a good sign. No offense. I'm a baby. I know. (laughs) (laughs) And had three older siblings. His dad, Richard, deserted the family and three kids while John was still really young. So his mother, Loretta, remarried, but the marriage only lasted a year. And so Loretta felt like she needed a fresh start. Things weren't working out where she was, and she moved to Detroit with the kids. I mean, fortunately, this was a long time ago. This was <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend that move for the kids nowadays, but in the 50s, I'm sure it was fine, right? Cheap rent? Yeah. Um, yeah. So she soon met and fell in love with a man named William Collins. The couple married and William adopted the kids. He took them in, started to raise them as his own. So John's last name was changed to Collins, like his new stepfather. But unfortunately, his new stepfather was a violent alcoholic who abused his wife and also the children. I mean, but he still adopted the kids. But he took them in, right? (laughs) You just needed a cool last name. I can drink all I want. Usually, you know, the drunk alcoholic stepdad is like, that's not my kids. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You would think, you'd be like, I don't claim them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Not mine. Take them on Maury and shit. (laughs) So Loretta and William's marriage ended in 1956. So if you're following along doing the math, that means that John had three different father figures before the age of nine. And none of them really seemed particularly loving or positive. You know, I think that it was a nice gesture that the guy wanted to adopt them as his own kids, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they were good father figures, any of the people he had in his life, you know? Mm -hmm. So Loretta became a single mother and supported her kids as a waitress. 
but money was, of course, really tight. In high school, John was an honors student and a star athlete in three different sports. Right? Okay. All right. <laughs> I can Good barely do one of those things well. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Especially with a shitty home. like, Or maybe right. that's why he did so good. Yeah, he's then like, you're just – It's like, I'll stay for practice. No yeah. problem. Keep me as long as you want. Right? <laughs> Put me in coach. Yeah. John was a star pitcher for the baseball team and captain of the football team. People that knew him said that he was really polite. He was quiet. He was very nice and respectful. However, girls that he dated say that he was moody and that he had some anger issues. He was reportedly obsessed with bondage, violent sex, mutilation, and excessive gore. Which... (laughs) (laughs) Your face. And he's the captain of the team? Yeah. It seemed like he had kind of this duality to his personality where it's like he kept his shit together in a lot of different areas, but then... He was kind of into some weird shit secretly. Feel that. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of the story of my life. (laughs) There is kind of a concerning incident that happened while he was young. In his high school years, he found his sister hooking up with a guy and flew off the handle, completely lost his shit. He beat his sister so badly that she had to go to the emergency room and she was subsequently hospitalized. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. hmm. So I think that even though he was keeping together and really polite and sweet and a lot of people had nice things to say about him, he was doing well in school and sports, there was this other part of him that was very close to losing it at any second and especially triggered by women, you know? Yeah, I wonder why he didn't beat the guy up and said he beat his sister up. Yeah, by by the accounts that I've seen, because I looked at a couple different sources, it seemed like he he hit the guy, but it was mostly focused at his sister. You know, like it's not like – of course, the guy probably tried to defend the girl and he, you know, hit him a couple times, but it was really his sister that he lost it on. Which is fucked up. Yeah, it's super fucked up. Well, I mean, the whole thing is fucked up. Jesus. How do you get out of the hospital and be like, all right, I'm going to. If I walked in on my sibling, I would just be like, e. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell like, mom. I would just be super grossed out. Yeah. I wouldn't get crazy. I would like... blackmail them to get what I wanted so they didn't tell the parents. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I'll take three cookies every day. You got to do the dishes. Yeah. You take out the trash. <laughs> <laughs> just seems like there's a better way to handle that yeah. situation. So after high school, John began attending Eastern Michigan University in 1966. His goal was to major in education, and he wanted to teach elementary school. No. Right. (laughs) Leading the minds of future generations. (laughs) Jesus. When he was in college, he continued his involvement in sports. He became the vice president of the ski club. And joined Theta Chi fraternity. I didn't even a ski club. It, I mean, <laughs> it's I guess that's some cold weather shit. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we have a snowboard club here in California. Or something. We probably do somewhere. Somewhere Northern California. Fuck club. But it's chill. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Fuck clubs, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> You mean you weren't involved in clubs in high school? Only if they were going on field trips. <laughs> Swear to God. Tell me you snuck on a field trip with a club. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, the LGBTQ one went to the <laughs> – they had like the – some type of award show. Oh. It was pretty sick. Got in. All you had to do was sign up and be a part of the club for a day. That's cool. That's good, yeah. So, well, I, I was in the LGBTQ club. That was the only club I was in. Yeah. But we never did any field trips. That would have been rad. Wrong high school. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know about ski club, though. No. That's not nearly as cool. And, of course, like I said, he was in a fraternity. And I'm not too hot on frats either. So fuck that. My dad was um, a cheerleader and was in a frat. Well, he's a yell leader. You can't call him a cheerleader. (laughs) He's a yell leader. You got to get it right. 
I am calling your dad a cheerleader literally every time I see him from now on. Do it. He loved it. He'll tell it. He'll probably say he did it to get girls, too. I the, guess cheerleading oh, was different course, back then? Of course he did. Like, I would. that's the first guess that I had. Yeah, That's absolutely. just your dad. But now thinking about it, he looks like he could have been a cheerleader. Oh, golf club, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's hilarious. Dad, the next time we see him, just <laughs> I gotta clown and laugh. him so bad. He'll show you his jacket too. He's got the Chatsworth. Wow. <gasps> My mom went to Chatsworth. Was she a cheerleader? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she was more of a beach bum. Oh, okay. Cute. <laughs> anyway, so around this time, John began developing a little problem with stealing became a little bit of a sticky fingers. So his frat brothers said that he would steal motorcycles and motorcycle parts. And nobody thought much of it at first because they're like, well, he's just out there taking cars, doing whatever. It's not that big of a deal, which I kind of don't understand. I kind of do. Like, they're like, well, it's not me, so I don't give a fuck, right? (laughs) But then things began disappearing around the frat house. He started stealing golf clubs, watches, money, whatever was laying around. And eventually, he was asked to leave the fraternity when $40 disappeared from their activities fund. So I did the conversion, and that would be like 300 bucks oh, today. Yeah. And I'm assuming activities fund is just like for strippers and blow-up dolls and shit like that Kids. if you're in a fraternity. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So don't fuck with our beer money. That's when you get kicked out. Roofie yeah. funds, something. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just, I always assume that fraternities are up to no good, for sure. Right? I think you just get them hammered. I don't even think you need a roofie. Oh, no. I feel like girls just come over. They have like a. I, I don't understand the Greek system whatsoever. I don't get why people go into it. And they're like, it's camaraderie. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Why yeah, do people but... join gangs? I'd rather join a gang. I would so, <laughs> so rather. Come on. Go do meet up or some sort of something. I don't know. Yeah. We're a gang. <laughs> <laughs> so after he was kicked out of the frat, John moved in with his friend, Andrew Manuel, who was also a thief and petty criminal. So they began stealing together. And people say they kind of had this pretty successful burglary ring or whatever. So they were stealing a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah. So he pretty much did join a gang of two. (laughs) So they were known to steal bikes, cars, money, valuables, guns, jewelry, whatever they wanted. Yes. They stole a lot of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. They also did some kind of like fraud stuff where they would steal checks or IDs, whatever. Yeah. They sound like a bunch of tweakers. Yeah, I know. Car parts and checks and... It's almost surprising that they don't have a drug problem. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I get it if you're high, but yeah. if you're sober, no. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so people also say that after he was kicked out of the frat, he became a lot more angry and introverted. His teachers said that he was previously a really good student his grades suddenly plummeted once the fraternity kicked him out. So he was he was pretty heartbroken and upset. My, my brothers don't love me anymore or something. <laughs> so he should have graduated in 1969, but he was 24 credits short and he just made no attempt to make that up. He could have done it over the summer and graduated on time, but it just, he didn't even try basically. While his school life was getting more difficult, people also began noticing some of his negative attitudes toward women coming out. When he dated girls, they said that he was often really pushy with them, very insistent, very sexually aggressive. A woman he knew remembered him saying that he hated girls with pierced ears because they, quote, left holes that defiled their bodies. I mean, <laughs> it's his opinion, I guess. I don't know. Is he wrong? <laughs> you know, people don't like tattoos on people. I guess I don't know. Yeah, suicide girls are not his thing. I get it. It's cool. Totally. Whatever. We don't like you either. Yeah, on to the next. <laughs> just 
what? Yeah, but he was really insistent about how it just said something about who they were as a person, kind of, you know, like if they have pierced ears, then their bodies are done with forever or something. That's some <laughs> biblical shit. Yeah, we pierce babies' ears. Like, <laughs> so what? Like, like, that's the thing. Like, my dad's Mexican. You know how old I was when oh, I, I had my ears pierced? Dude, <laughs> I was like three months old when I had my ears <laughs> <Totally>. pierced. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't get that sort of mentality, but whatever. One woman said he began quoting the Bible at her because he thought that she was dancing too provocatively. <laughs> <laughs> that is the greatest. Oh, man. <laughs> Which would only make me more aggressive. Like, yeah. uh-huh, really? Oh, I'm a twerk Ooh, now. Oh, let's yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say drop it? <laughs> commandment thou shalt clap on that ass <laughs> <laughs> yeah i bet uh, yeah he just sounds like no fun he's just shouting it at her that's just so good right like you're just at a party minding your own business doing the twist <laughs> you know <laughs> who invited him to the party yeah Where the fuck is he there fucking party pooper jesus Another woman said he told her a story about how he strangled a cat with a clothesline. And while he was telling the story, he put his hands around her throat. Is it thou shalt not fucking kill cats in the Bible or is that just? <laughs> it's another commandment. No dancing and no cats. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, f- fucking crazy. Fuck, There's man. a lot of this kind of firsthand accounts of him doing things that were – creepy kind of trying to scare women or make them feel like they were weaker than him that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. so but that's fucking terrifying and how what do you say to get yourself out of that situation if you're that woman you know like hey man knock it off but you know he's the kind of guy that's not going to listen to you that's terrifying isn't where i parked my car (laughs) (laughs) fuck out of here yeah yeah Another former girlfriend said that he yelled at her when he found out that she was having her period and called her, quote, disgusting. I agree with that one. <laughs> That's exactly I do the same thing to myself. I feel that way about myself, but nobody else can say it to me. That's like a your mama joke or something. Yeah. Like you can't you can't say that. Only I can yell at my vagina and call it disgusting. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Also, it's just like you – even though I do talk to myself like that sometimes just to be real, like if you're a man, you're not a man. Like yeah. if you talk that way to a woman, like About come on. a period, yeah. Yeah, just grow the fuck up. Yeah. It's biology. Mm-hmm. Grow up, dude. Mm-hmm. It's a good sign. You're not a daddy every right? month, like, so It really should be like you You don't have offspring. Yeah. How, how you is- should thank me. <laughs> <laughs> As your girlfriend, you should be like, thanks, babe. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for bleeding. <laughs> um, how does he have so many girlfriends? I know. Well, here's the thing. He really was charming. Okay. When people say he was nice and polite and whatever, I mean – his first impression was always really good. Okay. We've got women saying this, some of his classmates, there's adults that said that about him, teachers. He was just really a charming guy. I, I don't know. And people said that he was good looking and he just kind of would walk up and charm people and then they were his friend. And then he would do some creepy bullshit and they weren't his friend anymore, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But yeah, he did have a lot of girlfriends or not, you know, friends that are women, girlfriends, people that he dated, Mm -hmm. but a lot of them were female and he just charmed them somehow. Mm. So he also began telling people that if a man had to kill, he killed. If he decided it was right for him to do it, then he had to do it. He believed that the perfect crime was when there was no guilt. Because without guilt, a person could not get caught. He would, I guess, kind of give people that lecture in social interactions when he was talking to them. And then he also wrote an English paper, uh, like expressing that whole theory and how it works. Yeah. So it was something that people recall him talking about and that there's some written proof that he felt that way. Creepy as fuck. I wonder what grade he got. 
<laughs> yeah. When he was around 20 years old, he found his first victim, Mary Fleezar, at Eastern Michigan University. Mary Fleezar was nicknamed Chi Chi, which is adorable. Mm-hmm. She grew up on a farm in Willis, Michigan, with three brothers and three sisters. She was a really good student. She was involved in a bunch of extracurricular activities. She was in the language club. She was the yearbook editor. And she liked painting and sewing and craft kind of stuff. She was also a really talented musician. She taught herself guitar and piano. And she was also the percussionist from the school band, which I think is the coolest part of the school band. Totally. (laughs) She began college in Eastern Michigan University in 1965. She double majored in French and accounting, which is an odd pairing. Yeah. (laughs) But she wanted to become a French interpreter. That was her goal. So I guess maybe she wanted to open her own business or something and run an interpreting business. I don't know. But in July 1967, she went for a walk after telling her roommates that she she just wanted to go out for a stroll. And um, while she was out walking, her neighbors were on the front porch and saw that there was a blue and gray car that pulled up next to her. The person in the car, of course, we know, was John Collins. But the neighbors just saw that he was offering her a ride. And they saw that she reacted like she didn't know the person and she declined the ride. She shook her head. She said no. And she started to walk away. But the car followed her, kept talking to her. She, the neighbors say that they saw her keep shaking her head, waving him off, trying to get him to go away. So he pulled up in front and went a little bit faster. And I guess they thought it was over. But then he pulled into a driveway in front of where she was walking and blocked the sidewalk. (laughs) (laughs) I I hate when you like, (laughs) you look so creeped out. I'm sorry. No, it's good. (laughs) This is what I want. So while he was in front of her, she, you know, again, shook her head. She tried to get him to go away. And she walked in front of the car, around it, and back onto the sidewalk and kept walking. Mm -hmm. And once she kept walking, she was out of sight of where the neighbors could see her. But the neighbors did see that the car pulled out of the driveway, backed up, and then, like, tires screeching, sped off down the block. But they were the last people to see Mary alive. On August 7th, her body was found in a rural area by teenage boys. And that was only about three miles away from where she lived. Mary was stabbed 30 times in the chest and the abdomen. Her fingers were cut off on one side of her body, and on the other side, her entire forearm was missing. What? Oh, man. The kind of theory behind this was possibly this was the, the first murder, so possibly they were thinking, he was thinking to take fingerprints, so that maybe they couldn't identify her or something. I'm not sure. But it was just missing both hands. And there's some sources that say that her feet as well were missing and some that just say it was her hands. Uh, Decomp was too advanced to see if she had been raped, but it was assumed that she was sexually assaulted because she was found naked. Two days later... Again, the person that we now know as John Collins showed up at the mortuary just before closing and asked permission to take pictures of the body. <laughs> I'm sorry. He showed up. Yeah. Uh, they said no, right? Exactly. And yeah. And took down his license plate and just <laughs> asked him to fingerprint himself and smile. That would be too simple. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he was just, you know, can I take pictures? He said that he was a member of the family. And so that's why. But the person that was working there said the family has requested that this be a closed casket. So we're not allowing you to take pictures. Nobody is going to see the body. And they asked him to leave. 
They didn't get a license plate number and they just gave a description to the police. So, I mean, fortunately, they made the report. However, they didn't have too much information. Let him in. Let him think he's going to take pictures. Right? Call the cops. Lock him in the kitchen or whatever it is in a morgue. I don't know. Yeah. Please, sir, come this way and then go into the bathroom and then just shut the door <laughs> just behind lock him. him in there. Yes. I'm all for that. They don't even know, you know, if he was the murderer or anything. Just no. if you do something that creepy, I think you should be locked in a bathroom for a minute and just be able to think about your life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How many weird questions do they get to where they didn't call the cops like right then? They must get some fucked up questions. They must see some crazy shit. Yeah. yeah to not have called the cops immediately yeah. while he was like, can I take? And then just yeah. like, phone 911. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty crazy. So a year went by and the police had no leads on this murder. They figured that it was an isolated incident because there was only one murder at this time until another girl was abducted. Joan Shell was an art major from Plymouth, Michigan, who had just moved into a house really close to the university. On June 30th, 1968, she was dropped off at school after spending a weekend home with her parents. So her parents dropped her off, and she didn't tell them that she was planning on meeting up with her boyfriend afterwards. I think that she was dropped off at night, and she didn't say anything because it was getting late. She didn't want them to worry about her going out late. But she planned to take a bus to see her boyfriend Dale Schultz in Ann Arbor after they dropped her off. The trip it really should have been, I don't know, like a half hour trip, maybe with walking and bus time or whatever, an hour. It should have been really quick. So her roommate went and walked to the bus stop with her. Mm -hmm. She said that at least she would walk her there, you know. While they were waiting at the bus stop, they saw the very last bus of the night pass them by because it was full of passengers already. You make that face like you've been there. I've been there. <laughs> like a I feel times. your pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Joan decided that she would hitchhike, even though her roommate advised against it. So she couldn't talk her out of it. She, of course, tried to stop a couple cars or whatever. And eventually a red car pulled up with a black top that had three guys in it. Yes. <laughs> Perfect ride. I was you guys on some super old dude. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, oh, no? it was three oh. guys. I don't know. That's just Is it weird? Scary. <laughs> like, let me scooch it. I got I'll sit middle. There's really part of me that wants to believe there's more people, so there's less likelihood that someone yeah. will do something fucked up totally. because we're not alone. There's more than one person to see. Yeah. But then there's the other part of me that's just like, well, if you decide to gang up on me, I'm fucked. One on one, I think I could take you. you know? <laughs> there's something about it. I don't know. It's scary. See, you're just negative. I'm thinking there's more people. There's good conversation, oh, different viewpoints. No, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm in the, the true crime mindset at the moment. So I'm definitely thinking what's Murder. the worst case scenario okay. here. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. But she decided to get in. You know, she probably thought the same thing as you. It's just like good conversation. Yeah. There's more people. Dude. There's like, oh, okay, I'm meeting a few people that are students here or whatever, you know. But she got in and the roommate saw the car drive away and made two turns in the opposite direction of oh, Anna no. Arbor. Yeah. I, I would still try if I was the roommate to keep kind of positive and be like, well, maybe they're dropping someone else off first or yeah. something. You know, like if you're hitchhiking – you're kind of at the whim of whoever you're with. So I don't know. I would try and keep positive, but the roommate kind of knew immediately that something was wrong. Yeah. Man, cell phones are great. You can just text, hey, you good? Or right? like something. <laughs> Drop a pin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, like, Fuck, thank God yeah. for technology. Yeah, and Lyft and Uber. And Lyft, yeah. Yeah. Fuck. So hours passed by and Joan's boyfriend, Dale, Never heard from her. She never showed up. So she, he called Joan's roommate to see where she was. The roommate informed him what had happened, what she saw, and they both decided that it would be best if she called the police. Mm -hmm. So the roommate filed a police report immediately with officers and the boyfriend, Dale, 
got some friends together and decided to go driving looking for her because he was close enough to where they could get in cars and go look for a red convertible. It's a pretty, you know, it's easy to spot. Yeah, noticeable. Yeah. Stand out. Four eyewitnesses near the bus stop disagreed about whether the car was a Pontiac or a Ford, but everyone agreed that it was red. So they went out looking for a red car, but nobody found it. There was nobody that saw where it went. That was the last time that anybody saw that convertible or Joan. Joan's body was found five days later by construction workers who noticed a foul smell and traced it back to a decomposing corpse hidden in some bushes. Joan was stabbed 47 times and sexually assaulted. The injuries she had were so extensive that her spine was severed and her skull was fractured. Oh, damn. Yeah. She was also strangled with the mini skirt that she was wearing at the time. Although she was missing for five days, medical examiners determined that the body was most likely only moved to that spot about one day prior to being discovered. The body was really clean. It, they knew that it hadn't really been outside for a long time. And there was also no blood at the scene, so it really couldn't have been the murder sh- scene as well. Meaning he like kept the body for a bit? Yeah, it was probably in a different location that the murder happened and he kept her there and then decided, you know, after about four days, three, four days to bring it to wherever it was discovered. Mm -hmm. So at first, the police suspected the boyfriend, Dale Schultz. Dale Schultz was living under an alias, Jason Court, because he was AWOL from the army. While he was AWOL using this alias, he was able to live with friends and get a job and support himself and just kind of have this secret life. But the police found this a bit sketchy and they thought that he was kind of a viable suspect, you know. But Dale had an alibi and he passed a polygraph. Not sketchy. Vietnam sucks. (laughs) (laughs) Like, honestly, I'm like, yeah. I would probably go AWOL. I don't think I could hang. Nope. I definitely Mm-mm. don't think I'd make it. I I highly respect people that can, but man, it's not in me. I, I'm gay. I don't know. Is that, is that, I just be gay. <laughs> right then. They don't like, yeah. That's of, what Jimi Hendrix did. You said he was gay? Yes. Did I not know this? He, he said he was to get out of the army. And then afterwards, he faked an injury as well. That's hot. <laughs> More tidbits I don't need to know, but somehow they're in my brain. I feel better that I know these things, so thanks. I feel better that I'm like Jimi Hendrix. (laughs) I would say the same thing, dude. (laughs) So after they cleared him of it, the detectives began working on the theory that the two murders were linked to a serial predator instead of somebody that the victims knew. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of were operating on this thing that it was – one victim's boyfriend or an acquaintance or whatever, but now they thought that this was a predator going after women that he didn't even know, you know. So campus security informed detectives that a student at EMU named John Norman Collins had talked to another student about the gruesome details of Joan Shell's murder. Way to go, campus security. (laughs) Picking up clues, doing better than the cops and everything. That's like the only thing I've ever heard them doing that's good. Right. (laughs) I don't know one other. At least in the U.S. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. But when they brought him in and they questioned him, John was really polite. He was unassuming. He was very respectful, like people always described. And he said that he was at his mother's house at the time of the murder and that he was only retelling the details of the murder because he had heard them from someone else. John claimed that his uncle, who was a state trooper, had told him about the details of the murder, and that's why he knew everything, and he was just telling people and talking about it, making conversation. Okay, call that uncle. Exactly. So, his state trooper uncle, named Daniel Like, said that he had not talked to John about the case, (laughs) but... He did theorize that maybe his nephew had heard some of the details because um, he had talked to officers. 
John was known to hang out at this local restaurant, like a diner kind of place that was known to be a really big cop hangout. So all the cops stopped in there and ate. Right? No, I just want to do it. My butthole is The look tight. of fear in your face. I could see things happening in your butthole. <laughs> Cop hangout. What? I got to scram. You ever just walk into a place high and then you see cops and then you like try to walk out and then it's like I can't oh, do yeah. it. I try and I just, moonwalk and there's still yeah. smoke coming in from after me. Exactly. And I moonwalk backwards into the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, cops. <laughs> Sometimes I wave. <laughs> so John was the opposite of us. He would seek out those officers to talk to. And we see this a lot with murders yeah. where they like want to be involved in investigations. Mm -hmm. They're curious about details of crimes. They may even apply to be a police officer themselves. Mm -hmm. It's pretty common. So, you know, he would just hang out at this diner and – you know, sit at the counter or whatever, a cop would sit next to him and he would just start asking them about their cases or start asking them who they busted recently, whatever kind of details. Mm -hmm. So his uncle thought that that's probably where he heard some of the information about Joan Shell's murder. Totally. But he just lied and said it was him. So right. if you lie- That's the first thing is like, um, why would you have to say that? Yeah. Just say that. Maybe we should look into this yeah, further. It's a lie. Yeah. We should look into that. No. Mm -hmm. I think they need cops that are street smart like us. <laughs> Seriously. And well, if your uncle is a cop too, I mean, why are they going to expect you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just the whole thing. It just doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. Why lie about it? Why hang out with cops? <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's just, it's just not right. So the uncle and the detectives assumed that that had to be the explanation. It had to be the diner. It can't be that he's a murderer. So, again, because he was so charming, they assumed that he was telling the, the truth about his alibi and about, the, you know, how he heard details of the murder. Eavesdropping. That's their fucking answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So they oh, cleared man. him as a suspect. Around this time, another student says that she went on a motorcycle ride with John. They stopped to rest in the shade of a tree and John asked her if she would be scared if she found out that he was the co-ed killer. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> no, no, no. Check this out, right? <laughs> so if I was. <laughs> um, yeah. Gonna <laughs> disrespect. <laughs> So he told her that she could be the next victim because she was alone with him. At first, she thought that he was kidding. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> you're so funny, oh though. Oh, my God. You make you me laugh. You just tell the funniest jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that one where you're like a murderer. <laughs> but he remained serious and she became really uncomfortable. Yeah. Of course. Somehow she was able to laugh it off, de-escalate the situation, and three drove back to the school without anything happening. She's like, what'd you say? He's like, uh, I'm going to kill this pussy. Right. <laughs> All right, let's go back to school. <laughs> that I'm cool with. <laughs> so when they got back to school, she just dismissed it as this weird incident. You know, she didn't report it to anybody. She was just like, okay, that was weird. Maybe I just won't hang out with him again. And that was it. I don't get it. In I hindsight, in when hindsight. he was when he was caught, she came forward. But yeah, at the time she was like, okay, well, he seems nice enough, like everybody else. He seems nice enough. I guess that was just a joke or something. Yeah. Eight months passed before another woman named Jane Mixer disappeared. Jane was extremely driven and a brilliant woman who was really independent and very headstrong. Jane was her high school valedictorian, and during her graduation speech, she passionately urged her fellow graduates to fight for social justice, which really angered the school officials. What? I don't know if she turned in her speech beforehand and it was a completely <laughs> different speech, but all of a sudden she just went into this, you know, big social justice speech. In 1969, when she was only one of 37 
female law students in her class of over 400. Oh, shit. Yeah. She was really passionate about taking action, and she said she wanted to change the world. You know, she was on a mission. On March 20th, 1969, Jane was heading home to announce her engagement to her family. Jane had met her boyfriend, Phil Weitzman, at the university while he was getting his doctorate in economics. She was really nervous since she also planned on telling her family that she would be relocating to New York because her fiancé had got a teaching position there. So she posted on a rideshare board so that she could get a lift home to Muskegon to see her family. Her boyfriend said that no one really thought anything of it because at the time everybody used rideshare boards. It was a very normal thing. It was seen as kind of the responsible alternative to hitchhiking, you know, because you could meet someone in advance. They were from the school, the same school that you went to. You knew who they were, you know. It wasn't just a complete stranger. Yeah, we still do it on Craigslist, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, still, still do. do it on Lyft. Yeah. <laughs> so her sister, Barbara, said that they talked on the telephone and Barbara advised her to come with her fiancé, Phil, instead of getting a rideshare. Jane said that she thought it would work out better if they came separately so that she could tell her family the news in advance of him arriving. And her sister, Barbara, said... You know, it's still, it's not a good idea. It's not safe. But Jane just reassured her and she said, trust me. And that was the last conversation that they had. No. Oh, no. (laughs) Trust me was the last. Oh, man. I know. That makes me so sad. Everything was fine, right? Just go ahead. Continue the story. Jane had told her parents that she would be leaving Ann Arbor around 6 p.m. and she was expecting to arrive by about 9.30 that evening. When many hours passed and they hadn't heard from her, they called her boyfriend and figured out that she was missing. They filed a police report and her father also, again, went out driving to look for her. Maybe she was walking part of the way, maybe he could find the bus or whatever, you know. The next morning, 13-year-old Mark Grow was walking to his school bus stop, and as he passed by a cemetery, he found a bag with school supplies and a present and a card. He ran the bag back home to give to his mom, and then he returned back to the bus stop. His mother opened up the bag, looked through it, And she saw that there was blood on the items. So she decided to go back to the cemetery and look around. Near the entrance of the cemetery, she saw a body with a yellow raincoat on top of it, with a bullet wound and a nylon stocking tied around her neck. The killer left her out in the open on top of a grave, just steps away from the front gate of the cemetery. A medical examiner said that the silk stocking was placed around Jane's neck after she had already died from the gunshot wounds and wasn't a factor in her death. On the night of the murder, a station wagon was seen looping through the cemetery and speeding off, but the car was never tracked down. My opinion is this is probably John, especially my first thought, of course, it would be leading to him because he steals cars. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that was the first thought that I had when I heard that. I was like, okay, a station wagon. You didn't really have to link a car to him because he was always driving a different car, a different motorcycle, you know? And that's one of the ways that he was hard to identify, you know? Detectives first looked into her boyfriend again, but he submitted to a search of his home, his vehicle, and he passed a polygraph, and they cleared him as a suspect. Detectives then figured this murder, again, must be linked to the previous killings. The police did see this crime as a bit different from the previous ones, though. First, the killer had used a gun, unlike the previous killings, and also there were no signs of sexual assault. 
in this murder. Despite these differences, detectives knew that they had a serial killer on their hands. Jane Mixer was the third woman in the area to turn up dead in the past two years. And four days later, another body was found. The next victim, Marilyn Skelton, grew up with an abusive alcoholic father and became a really rebellious teen who seemed to kind of constantly be getting into trouble. Marilyn had an older boyfriend, as a rebellious teen does, that her parents didn't approve of, but she constantly snuck around to see him. She used drugs and was known to sell drugs to make money. She sold, uh, from what I heard, pot and speed, LSD, and heroin. She's my new favorite. I love her so much. (laughs) (laughs) She had been arrested on drug charges and had turned informant. So police were already familiar with her. Don't like her anymore. (laughs) (laughs) That was quick. That was the quickest friendship you've ever had. (laughs) Her parents had decided recently that they wanted to move to Flint, Michigan, in hopes that kind of they could get their 16-year-old daughter out of her current friend group and out of the trouble she was getting into and away from negative people. Marilyn, when she found this out, was furious with her parents. And instead of, you know, this kind of helping some of the issues, she began getting even more rebellious and getting into more trouble. She was supposed to meet up with a friend on the university campus, even though she was only 16, she was supposed to go there to meet someone, but couldn't get a ride. So she decided to hitchhike. She never showed up to meet with her friends. And after she went missing, her mother initially wasn't really worried. She wasn't concerned about it because Marilyn frequently would, again, sneak around, disappear, run away, those sort of things. So her mom just thought this was another one of those times, you know? it's not out of the norm. Exactly. So since she frequently didn't come home, it was a couple days before her mom decided to contact the police. Oh, no. Yeah. So after a few days when she got worried, she asked the police to help find her. On March 25th, construction workers near where Joan Shell's body was found discovered the body of 16-year-old Marilyn Skelton. Marilyn was bludgeoned to death. A garter belt was tied around her throat, and a tree branch had been inserted into her vagina and a cloth was stuffed into her mouth. Police also observed marks that indicated that she was hit with a belt that probably had a belt buckle during the attack. Her mother initially thought that this must have been a drug-related incident, but Marilyn's toxicology reports came back clean. According to her boyfriend, she also hadn't owed anybody a substantial amount of money at the time, so it seemed odd that it would be drug-related since I think the biggest debt she had was like 10 or 20 bucks, something like that. So the brutality of the murder didn't make sense that it would be linked to any debt that she owed or anything like that. Three weeks later, another girl went missing that was younger than the previous victim's. Dawn Basom was a popular 13-year-old girl that had average grades. She was a tomboy that was always playing outdoors with her friends. Dawn was the youngest of four kids who were raised by a single mother after their father passed away from cancer when Dawn was only nine years old. Dawn knew about the murders, but she said that the other victims were brunette And since Dawn was a blonde, it would be okay for her to hitchhike. (laughs) Sorry. I mean, I get it, the reasoning, but. Yeah, I think think that's kind of like, yeah, you really do want to believe that that you're safe. And also, you kind of want to believe that monsters aren't out there, but. And any reason sounds. Yes, any reason's good enough. Yeah. But Dawn went to meet up with a friend, and on her way home, A friend accompanied her part of the way back to her house. 
once she parted ways and she was alone, she ran to into another couple friends that were fishing and then talked with them for a few minutes and then again continued alone walking home. Two other eyewitnesses saw her around 7.30, but she never made it home. On April 15th, 1969, Cleo Basom reported her 13-year-old daughter Dawn missing. Around sunrise, a truck driver called to report that he had seen a body on the side of the road. Police went to the scene and found Dawn's half-naked body. Dawn had been stabbed and strangled with electrical wire. She also had a piece of cloth stuffed into her mouth, like the previous victim. Police say that one of the last wounds was a stab in the left chest, probably most likely to make sure that she was dead. She was last seen walking along a dirt road where John Collins rode his motorcycles on a daily basis. Of course, they didn't know that at the time, but later it was linked to him. Because she was so dirty when she was found, detectives thought that her murderer, again, may had taken her to a different area for the murder and then dumped her at a different space. They, their first thought was that it may have taken place in an abandoned farmhouse in the area. So they started canvassing around the neighborhoods and any of the local areas where they could find a farmhouse. Pretty soon, they found some of her clothes near an abandoned farmhouse. When they looked inside, they found a roll of the same type of electrical wire that had been used to strangle Dawn. The farmhouse was less than a mile from her home. She was so close. And it was also less than a mile from where Mary Fleezar's body was discovered in 1967. They also found buttons, fabric, fibers, and tissue with semen on it. When I say tissue, I mean like Kleenex okay. with semen on it. Okay. Sorry, just to clarify. After the murders, police patrolled the farmhouse regularly because they were hoping that, like many murders do, that he would return to the scene and that they would catch him in the act, basically, trying to revisit the crime scene. On one patrol three weeks after the murder took place, they found a scrap of fabric from Dawn's clothing that her mom identified she was wearing at the time, and another earring because when they found the body, she only had one earring, so they found the other earring. The items were placed out in the open, where the police had clearly went over multiple times to find evidence, and the items had definitely not been at the crime scene originally, so they knew that the murderer was coming back and taunting them. How did they not see it? Oh, <laughs> right. man! yeah. Yeah, there was definitely some criticism from the public and the media saying, okay, how are you fucking up this case so badly? You were supposed to watch it. He came back. Yes. He did what you wanted him to do. Yeah. Oh, man. So, I mean, even though they had patrols, somehow he snuck through, got in and placed the items there and got out without being seen. You know, motion sensor light. Right <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Fuck. So one week after those items suddenly appeared at the farmhouse, the farmhouse was set on fire. <sighs> yes. So they ended up arresting a few EMU students for the arson, and they cleared those students of having anything to do with the murder. It was just somehow a stupid prank by college kids, basically. It wasn't John Norman Collins. It was a coincidence? That yes. Said that? Yes. However, after the fire, John taunted the police again by putting five lilacs in the driveway lined up near the farmhouse where she was murdered. Shut up. Yes. And the five lilacs represented one each for each victim. And the, th the flowers had been slit with a knife before he placed them there. Th these are reasons why I know that I couldn't be a murderer. Like, I would never even think of anything that creepy. Like, yo, let me slit this with a knife first. 
What the fuck kind of creepy shit is that? So on June 9th, 1969, another woman was found. It just keeps going. I <laughs> These episodes are so just one after Six the other. Lilacs. <laughs> God, more lilacs. He's going for a bouquet, man. He went back the, like four times. I don't get how the cops didn't see a guy laying fucking I flowers out. No. There was uh, one account where um, the police saw a jogger or someone running. But their radios somehow crashed. Like, they couldn't communicate. There was, like, multiple cars on patrol, but one couldn't communicate with the other to follow the runner. Some breakdown happened, and they he just got away. Conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how they just weren't uh, able to catch him. If he was revisiting like that, that's like fucking times. crazy. So... The next woman was 23-year-old fine arts grad student Alice Callum. She went to a friend's birthday party on June 7th, 1969, and friends recall seeing her, but they really don't remember when she left the party. They say that they saw her dancing. Some people said maybe she left around midnight. Some people say 11, but she was definitely there till pretty late at night. The next morning, a friend reported her missing. On June 9th, 1969, some teenage boys found Alice's body in a vacant field. Alice had been raped. She was stabbed several times. Her throat was slashed, and she was also shot in the head. Of course, at this time, the public outcry was increasing, and... People were very upset. The newspapers were constantly reporting about it. And so because there was so much pressure, there was a psychic that was brought in by the name of Peter Herkos, and he was supposed to help with the investigation. And in fact, the psychic wasn't even brought in by the police. He was brought in by the public. <laughs> your face <laughs> but people were getting desperate for someone to help get this killer off the streets you know so a psychic is what they came up with i mean not a better detective miss cleo not <laughs> she solved a lot of shit in my life i'm just <laughs> like all right that's cool i guess yeah i think that just to me it just speaks to desperation yeah you know like i know some people do believe in psychics and yeah, that's their totally. thing however I think that there's a lot of skeptics out there that don't believe, but I think at a certain point they were just willing to try anything. That's what it seems like, was just like, we need to get this done and we're going to do anything to make it happen. Yeah. So tell me how the psychic solved the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. <laughs> the thing was, this dude, Peter Herkos seemed to be putting on more of like magic trick shows than anything else. So no he showed up. Way. He dropped a couple bombs on the case like, "Oh, he, he said that the killer was going to be foreign born," which John was. Of course, they didn't know that at the time, and he would have foreign money in his pocket and like a couple weird facts like that, but nothing that would lead conclusively to a specific person. Nothing that helped solve the case. He was of no help at all. He just showed up and basically did some tricks and got some puss. Illusions. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He was trying to Chris Angel into somebody's panties or something. So, yeah, it just didn't lead to any anything being solved or any more details coming to light. But it's worth mentioning because, of course, the public was so desperate and – it was a weird, weird part of the case. <laughs> so on in June of 1969, John Collins, with, of course, all these things happening and the public being all crazy, fled the state with his friend and fellow criminal that we talked about before, Andrew Manuel. The pair was trying to get out of town for a bit because they had committed a string of burglaries that were also making headlines. It's unclear how much Andrew knew about the murders or if he knew if they took place at all, you know. But didn't he have like three people in that red car? That's something that is striking to me. Yeah. 
there's never been any link to Andrew being in that car. He's never admitted anything. However, it seems like if there were three people in that car and that was the car that that had anything to do with her murder, then he probably was one of the people that was and in there. he knew, dude. Right. There's no way you're burglaring, burglarizing right. thing. That's your bestie. You got to tell one person. He's telling random people. Like, I mean, I know weird? about all the people you've murdered. Of course. So. <laughs> He's telling random girls. Wouldn't it be weird if I was the co-ed killer? Like, right. You're like he so wouldn't tell his friend. Yeah. yeah. You're right. I ha- he has to know. I know. Yeah. I really do think he knew something. Yeah. Even if he – he just knew something. But I think that part of the reason they left town was really that they thought the police were going to catch them for the burglaries. Whether that in turn like domino effect led to leading – led to him being captured for the murders, mm-hmm. I don't know if that was a factor for Andrew. But they both didn't want to be caught with whatever kind of cars, money, jewelry that they had on them, you know? So they used a stolen check taken from the EMU campus to rent a trailer. They also used fake names at the rental place, and they used a stolen ID from an EMU student, and they told the rental employee that they were going to Canada. Instead of going to Canada, they drove John's mother's car attached to the trailer and rode out to California. That same summer... Roxy Ann Phillips was a nanny for the Kunis family in Salinas, California. I almost said California. (laughs) California. (laughs) 17-year-old Roxy was a singer and a talented violinist from Oregon. Roxy had a friend that was in Salinas named Nancy that she hung out with a lot while she was being a nanny. On June 29th, Nancy was walking home from visiting Roxy at the Kunis house when John Collins pulled up next to her in his car. He started telling Nancy that he was an EMU student and he was visiting California from Michigan and he was on a road trip with his his friend and trying to make conversation while also picking up on her, basically. And keep in mind, he's what? 22 or something. She's 16, 17, I think. They talked for a bit and John asked if he could take her on a date the next day. He was persuasive. She, you know, told her family and, and her friend that she had met a cute guy. They were going on a date, all that sort of stuff. But when the next day came around, he stood her up. Nancy never saw John or her friend Roxy again. On June 30th, Roxy had left the Kunis house to mail a letter, and she never came home. Her body was found in Monterey Bay. She had been strangled with the belt of her pantsuits. The area where Roxy's body was discovered had poison oak, So the detectives cleverly decided to check out any of the area hospitals and ask around if the doctors treated anybody for poison oak. Why? Yeah. They discovered that a man from Michigan named John Norman Collins was treated the day after the murder. (laughs) Ha (laughs) ha! Fuck you, John. (laughs) It's unclear, again, if Andrew knew about the murder and at this point he's on a road trip with him so i think that he probably knew something about roxy's disappearance and he nef- definitely knew enough to know that they needed to get out of town right after roxy was murdered where was andrew the whole time just hanging out in the trailer don't worry man you could just leave me here i'm gonna be <laughs> sitting in the trailer okay we're gonna meet up at this trip five o'clock <laughs> don't be late like And then he comes back covered in fucking poison oak, (laughs) wrassled. So the next day after the murder, they abandoned the rented trailer and hauled ass back to Michigan. Not suspicious. Not at all. Oh, yeah. Despite his, his efforts to completely clean the vehicle, there was a piece of fabric that matched the dress 
that Roxy was wearing at the time of her disappearance that was found in John's mother's car later on. Also later, hair fibers embedded in John's sweater were found to match Roxy's pubic hair. The theory was that while he was moving the body, he had probably put her over his shoulder, and that's how the hair transfer happened. So they returned to Michigan, where he met the final victim, Karen Bynaman. Karen went missing after leaving her dorm at EMU on July 23rd, 1969. Karen was only 18 years old, and she wanted to become a special education teacher. She was fresh out of high school. She'd just finished, and so this is over summer break, but she wanted to get a head start on the next year, so she enrolled in summer classes at EMU instead of waiting for the rest of the freshman class to start. On July 22nd, she sent a letter to her parents saying that she knew about the murders in the area, she was aware of what was going on, and that she promised them that she was being careful and that she was going to be safe. On July 23rd, she went to a wig shop in town to pick up something that she had ordered, I think for a wedding, if I remember correctly. While at the shop, she told the shopkeepers there that she had accepted a ride from a stranger on a motorcycle. The woman at the shop looked outside and she saw John Norman Collins waiting, leaning against his motorcycle. He was outside a chocolate shop and a couple people from inside the chocolate shop also recall seeing John Norman Collins. Usually he wasn't in the center of the town when he's seen with these other women, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Karen said that he had pulled up and offered her a ride, and he said that he would wait for her at the shop so that he could also give her a ride back to campus. The shop employees strongly urged her to not take that ride, Mm -hmm. right? So they were trying to convince her either to not go with him walk herself home, wait inside the shop, whatever it takes. And even one of the people that worked there said that they could give her a ride themselves just to keep her from taking a ride with a strange man. If that was me, I would do the same thing. Yeah, I don't just see some woman there out alone when I know a murderer is on the loose and let them take a ride from a stranger. I would, I would be, I would be that person too, trying to like mother her to safety. Mm -hmm. Karen said that the guy that was giving her a ride seemed like a really nice guy, and she basically was like, it's safe, he seems really sweet, everything's going to be fine, and she declined the offer from them, Said and she said that she would get herself home with him. So Karen left the shop, they saw her get on John's bike, and then she disappeared. That was the last time she was ever seen. Her body was discovered on July 23rd by a couple taking a walk in a wooded area. Worst date ever. Yeah. Yeah. She had been strangled, beaten, and her breasts and her stomach were scalded with some sort of chemical, it looked like. Karen's panties were wadded up and they were stuffed inside her vagina. On the panties, police found short, dark hair clippings that didn't match Karen. The clippings were kind of similar to what you would find on the floor of a salon or a barbershop, basically. Three days after Karen's murder, John's uncle, we remember before, the state trooper Daniel Like, returned home from a family vacation. John was supposed to be dog-sitting for the Like family while they were out of town. The family dog was kept inside the garage at the Like house, and John was supposed to just come walk the dog and feed him. They gave him keys to the house just kind of in case of emergency, but everything he needed, they said, was in the garage, 
They gave him keys to the house in case something happened, in case there was an emergency, but the Like family said that everything he needed to have access to was in the garage. When the Like family returned home from their vacation, they were really confused to find weird stains on the basement floor. So the uncle took scrappings from the floor that he kind of peeled up and found out that it was only paint on the floor. However, he also found that when he moved the washing machine to get the paint up, that there were hair clippings from where his wife would give the family haircuts in the basement. Oh, dang. Yes. Yeah. So she used to take them down there because it was really easy to clean up. And of course, she cleaned up after the haircuts, but didn't get underneath the washer. So he decided to take the hair clippings to the crime lab and see if they match the clippings found on Karen's underwear. There were also hidden blood stains underneath the washing machine no. that matched Karen. Those would be found later once they thoroughly looked at the scene. But initially, it was just the hair that was a match to the ones find, found on the underwear. So in addition to the hair clippings, John was also positively ID'd by the wig store employees, the chocolate shop employee, all the people in town that had seen him give her that ride. There was also another teenage girl that came forward and she said that John had attempted to pick her up earlier in the same day and she had refused the ride. <sighs> He's a fucking monster. He doesn't stop. No. So John Norman Collins was arrested and charged with the murder of Karen Feynman. Fucking slow clap. <laughs> <laughs> so John Norman Collins was arrested and charged with the murder of Karen Feynman. John's burglary partner, Andrew Manuel, that we talked about before, fled the state to stay with his sister immediately after John was arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so he ran to Arizona and police tracked him down and arrested him in August. Andrew was given immunity in exchange for testifying against John. The DA decided to charge John only with Karen's murder instead of charging basically all the cases at once, you know, this tactic ensured that in the event that John was found not guilty, that he could be tried again for the other murders. Instead of getting off on all five. Exactly. Okay. If they did all five at once, then double jeopardy would prevent them from t trying any of the murders, they you know? Mm -hmm. So they decided they would, this was their strongest case, especially in light of the blood being found and the fibers and hair. Mm -hmm. So they went with that one. After the jury deliberated for five days, they returned a guilty verdict and John was sentenced to 20 years. He's never been charged with the murder of any of the other six victims. No. Yeah. Still... Back in 1969, basically, the public was extremely relieved that he was off the streets. Even if he wasn't convicted of all the counts of murder, they were just glad that he couldn't do it again, you know. John, on the other hand, from the very time he was arrested, insisted that he was innocent. He kept saying, I've never met Karen. I've never met any of these women. I didn't do this crime. However, as soon as John was arrested, no more murders happened. So we can assume that they got the right man. John went through three appeals and he even changed his name back to his birth name, Chapman, in an effort to get uh, a transfer to Canada where he would have been eligible for parole earlier and been able to get out earlier. Fucking Canada. <laughs> <laughs> he also tried to escape once by tunneling out of the prison. Unsuccessful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? 
So Collins is now in his 70s and he's currently serving his life sentence in the Marquette Branch Prison in Marquette, Michigan. The state of California dis- declined to extradite John for the murder of Roxy Phillips. Since he was already convicted of this one murder and sentenced to life, it was considered too risky to try him for the California murder. Um, if they tried him for Roxy's murder again and he was found not guilty, then he would walk free. So they decided since he was already incarcerated and he was getting a life sentence, they would drop the case basically. So the murders of all the rest of the women except for Karen remained unsolved and were open cases. In 2002, a new generation of Michigan state detectives began reviewing all the cold cases that they had for the precinct. Jane Mixer's murder seemed to them to be different because she had not been sexually assaulted and her body had been covered with a coat. So that would make it seem like the killer either had remorse and guilt or compassion for the victim. And they thought that this didn't really fit John's MO. Mm -hmm. So the detectives decided that they would test DNA found at the crime scene. Lab technicians tested the residue from three drops of sweat that were found on the pantyhose that were found around her neck and then a single drop of blood that was found on her hand. The lab techs matched the sweat to a former nurse named Gary Leiterman. Oh, dang. (laughs) Some crazy shit. It's a twist! (laughs) (laughs) So detectives, then once they found this DNA match, they spent a couple months kind of doing some background investigating on Gary, and they eventually decided to contact him directly. The police kind of went up, knocked on his door in November 2004, and Gary initially thought nothing of it. He didn't know what their house call was about, but they started asking him questions. How often do you sweat, Gary? (laughs) (laughs) Are you known as a sweaty man? (laughs) How would you rate your sweat? Would you mind jogging for me? (laughs) Good, Gary, good. (laughs) Would you say you have man boobs? (laughs) So Gary said that he was kind of leading a pretty normal life. This kind of came out of nowhere and his mind started racing and he didn't know what it was about. But he thought that maybe there was a problem in the neighborhood, some sort of neighborhood watch thing, maybe some crime in the area, and um, that maybe he could help them. Yeah, it's been so long. He probably fucking forgot he did that shit. (laughs) It's like, what, Mert? Oh, Oh, right. Shit. Forgot about that one. So after talking with Gary for more than three hours, the detectives told him that his DNA was found at the murder scene of Jane Mixer. When Jane Mixer was murdered in 1969, Gary was 26 years old and single. He had served four years in the Navy and lived in a town about 20 miles from Ann Arbor. So Gary insisted that he didn't do this immediately. He admitted that he was working in the area. He was a a traveling pharmaceutical rep. He worked near the EMU campus, but he said that he didn't know the victim. So Gary pretty much went on with his life after this murder occurred, and he got married. He was married for 27 years. And the couple adopted uh, her niece and nephew after their parents passed away. Gary was a Civil War buff. He was a former school board member. He also coached Little League. At the time that the cops kind of showed up and knocked on his door, Gary and his wife were also additionally caring for his elderly parents that moved in with him. Wow, what a nice guy. Right? Like all these things, I'm just kind of like, this is weird. (laughs) 
And they had also taken in a foreign exchange student from South Korea. So show off, dude. (laughs) (laughs) You're making us all look bad, Gary. (laughs) Nobody cares if you have an A cup when you do all these nice things. (laughs) So uh, Gary had also later on developed a prescription painkiller addiction after he was battling kidney stones. He had some really bad pain issues, started to take painkillers and got addicted to them. You're making a me too bro face. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say addicted, but I get it. You no, know? <laughs> I was talking about the kidney stones. Oh, uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, so um, his, his addiction got bad enough to where he was forging prescriptions, abusing his medication, the whole thing. And if you remember correctly, he was a nurse mm-hmm. and he worked for some pharmaceutical companies. So he had a lot of access to this stuff. So eventually his addiction progressed and his stealing progressed to where he was arrested in 2001 for passing a forged script. When he was arrested in his car, the cops found a stack of blank prescription pads stolen from the hospital where he worked. So they arrested him. He pled guilty and he agreed to enter a drug rehabilitation program. As part of his arrest, he was also required to give a DNA swab under a state law that took effect three days before he was convicted of his drug crime. Yes. Yeah. So he like just met the cutoff (laughs) of giving his DNA. The swab he provided after the prescription charge linked Gary to Jane Mixer's murder. All the facts that we kind of just went through made it seem like he was a bit of an odd match because of the Little League and school board. He seemed like a really good guy taking in kids and elderly people. And so um, considering the life he led, the police were like, this doesn't really make sense. However, they did start looking into his house. They discovered a few creepy things when they did a search warrant on his home. In his office, they found two concealed Polaroid pictures of a 16-year-old South Korean girl who lived with them. What? As a foreign (laughs) exchange student. No! Yes. The images showed the girl who was unconscious, lying on Gary's bed with her clothing pulled like up towards her head and down towards her feet to expose just her genitals. Shut the fuck up, dude. Yeah. Detectives said that the posing of this girl was very similar to the way that Jane Mixer's body was found. The police questioned the exchange student that was in the pictures, and she said that she didn't have any memory of taking the photos. Yeah. Gary claimed that he found the photos and said that they were taken by the girl's boyfriend. So he claimed that he stumbled upon them and he was holding them until him and his wife could decide on how to handle the situation. They knew that they had to kind of ground her or punish her or some sort of something. So he was just holding them. I don't know if the wife corroborated that, but. The girl definitely said that that wasn't the case. Detectives also found a vial in Gary's shaving kit containing a mixture of volume and a sedative that combined would put a person into a very deep, sleepy state, nearly unconscious. Police interviewed people who knew Gary back earlier in his life, closer to the time of the murder. One former girlfriend said that he was sexually, quote, strange, (laughs) but hadn't been violent. Gary's former roommate told police that he was highly suspicious of Gary because Gary collected news clippings about all of the co-ed murders and he kept them in a closet. (laughs) (laughs) People 
saw this going on. You know that, right? Yes. Like, people that's... witnessed this. Yes. Okay. And they were like, not Gary. That's not weird. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, yeah. Str- what stra- define strange sex? Like feet strange? I couldn't tell you because I'm all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nobody really gave any details, hmm. but there was something okay. going on something there. Something strange. Yeah. And it seemed like uh, nobody mentioned anything about BDSM or anything more yeah. in the normal area of strange. Yeah. She just said he was strange. So I don't know what the, sp- the specifics were, you know? You wanted me to be a South Korean schoolgirl every night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't find that strange, but that's okay. It's the unconscious part yeah. that I'm really not cool with. Yeah. So the roommate also said that Gary bragged about a particular medication that he had that would render a woman unconscious with just one drop. Uh, Again, people knew this was going on. If I was the roommate, I would be like, oh, so you're that guy. Mm -hmm. Let me go call the cops right now. What's the name of the medication? (laughs) (laughs) I have really bad insomnia, so I'm kind of all about this. I just hate people. And I'm like, oh, you talk too much. Just shh. Can I see your Starbucks? I want to see what kind of drink this is. (laughs) How'd they write your name on the cup? (laughs) Pour the whole bottle. Oh, my God. Yeah. So Gary pled guilty to possession of child pornography for the picture. And then went to trial for the murders in 2005. They linked a note um, that was near the rideshare board where Jane Mixer had written down information um, to get a ride back to Muskegon. They linked this to Gary's handwriting in addition to the DNA evidence that they had. And his roommate, again, testified to his character and some of the weird things he noticed at the time. His roommate also testified to the fact that Gary owned a twenty-two caliber gun that could have been used in the murder. Although the sweat was linked to Gary, a test of the blood that was found on Jane Mixer's hand was linked through DNA to another person. Oh, my God. (laughs) Shit. It was linked to John Ruelas, who was a Detroit man serving serving life in prison for an unrelated murder. The problem was that by entering this evidence in with the DNA connection, the prosecutors had to admit that... John Ruelas was only four years old in 1969. Oh. So, so the defense attorney fought with them about the fact that the police lab had somehow contaminated the samples. And they tried to argue that the sweat DNA was contaminated as well. While the lab boss in his testimony could not explain the contamination of the blood sample, he swore that the sweat stains linked to Gary were valid. They acknowledged that the police in 1969 didn't follow proper procedure and protocol when they were storing the evidence and that that may have contributed to this cross-contamination. The items that were related to the Jane Mixer murder were kept in a bomb shelter at the police station, which could have led to the contamination. The jury believed the evidence against him was strong enough, and after just minutes of deliberation, the jurors found Gary Leiterman guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. And again, from behind bars, he continues to proclaim his innocence and he's appealing based on the DNA results that seem to be a little odd and possibly contaminated. But he's still in prison. So technically, we don't know about, we know one was John and one was Gary. Yeah. There's like The rest of them remain unsolved. Holy shit. Officially. Officially. It seems like the M.O., matched 
John for every other murder except for Jane. It was the only one where like a car wasn't involved. People didn't see someone, you know, giving a ride or, picking, yeah. you know, like it was just, I don't know. Ring. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. Fuck both those guys, man. <laughs> oh, like, oh, that's so sad. And I it just know. kept going on. Yes. And especially the stuff where it's just people recalling their last conversation with their loved one and and knowing that people were trying to be careful but just saying, oh, don't worry about me. I'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, I can take care of myself. Yeah, I'll make good. it. Yeah. I, we say that all the time. All don't the time. Worry. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. Worried. Um, also don't like that they could have caught him by just questioning in the beginning. Like, oh, you learned it from your yes. un- uncle? No, you didn't. So just once people start lying, it's easier to catch them if you just question them a little bit more, right? Seems- right? It's crazy. And also I wish that there would have been better storage of the evidence. Absolutely. Because there was no way to know later on that – there was no way to know that we would have the kind of DNA technology and what that would mean for mm-hmm. storing evidence. Like in 1969, you're not going to be like, what's the best way to store this so that in 30 or 40 years we can test it again? But, you know, it would have been nice if that would be the case because then we could probably link everybody else, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, I just, don't think that they preserved it well enough to link John Norman Collins. Hey, just throw it in a box in a room. Right. Like, <laughs> this is the Jane Mixer shoebox, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So. That was a good one, man. It's a long one. <laughs> I'm not walking home from college ever. <laughs> that was like the sound of music of cases. That was foreverness. More fun than Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was uh, John Norman Collins, University Part 3. Ugh. Yeah. So much. So sad. I know. Yeah. Good story. Good research, baby. (laughs) And there's still even stuff that I didn't really go into that much because I'm like, oh, this is just going to be five episodes long if I just (laughs) keep going. Jesus. A lot. It's good, though. So that's the end of Universities. (laughs) slow clap i loved it you was fun we're getting near the end man yeah we're coming pretty close to the end of the alphabet it's getting real close had to count five letters (laughs) (laughs) on my hand you didn't see that math and the alphabet (laughs) getting complicated yeah yeah so we're close and it's the holidays so we're gonna try and drop a couple bonus episodes Mm -hmm. shh don't tell So I guess before we sign off, we'll just remind you again to check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Martha, Andy, Chodes. Yeah, you (laughs) did it. Chodes, not Chodes. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you again to our Patreon supporters that were new for this week, Martha, Andy, and Chodes. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. The link for our Patreon and our thread list, if you want merch, bonus episodes, stuff like that. Uh, is going to be in our show notes. We've got um, a lot of of people that like the new designs on Threadless too, which is really cool. We've got a couple new designs on there, so check it out if you need mugs, t-shirts, housewares, if you need to redecorate your entire house with murder dictionary stuff, Mm -hmm. we got you. What else? There's going to be resources for domestic violence and mental health and uh, suicide prevention, a bunch of uh, hotline numbers and anti-bullying stuff that are always linked in our show notes. I can't remember if I mentioned at the beginning of the show that we have timestamps for when a story gets particularly brutal and Mm -hmm. fucked up, but we include those. So keep an eye out for those if you want to skip those parts. Tell your friends about us, right? Yeah, and tell your friends about us. Yeah. We're real nice ladies. <laughs> I mean, you are. <laughs> I'm a dick. Uh, but yeah, share if you want. That yeah, appreciate we appreciate it. We would really appreciate it if you would share uh, on your social media or just let people know and also kind of spread the word about podcasts. We find a lot of people don't know how to access podcasts. It's insane. <laughs> I, like people that are our age act like my parents. Like, now how do I right. access a podcast? Yeah. I mean, again, fucking Google. Put it into Google because it tells you everything. Right. Just type in the word 
podcast and any fucking theme you want. And I YouTube everything too. If I don't know how to do something, I teach myself through YouTube. YouTube University all the way. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. But some people aren't like that and they have a lot of questions about how how to podcast. So so if someone you know doesn't even listen to podcasts yet, it's not even just about our show. It's just about spreading the word about how awesome podcasts are. Mm -hmm. Like – we're all about that. Radio sucks now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Honestly, that too. It does. Yeah. So if you, you know, want to spread the word about podcasts in general, if you want to shout out our show, we would really appreciate that. It means a lot. And I love when I see people that are friends, like being like sharing our episodes with each other. Mm-hmm. It's really cute. So I think that's pretty much it for this week. And we'll see you on the flip side. Happy Hanukkah. You want to go light a menorah and chill? <laughs> Throw in some true crime. (laughs) Jewish true crime and chill. (laughs) (laughs) Lots of balls and true crime and chill. Faux show. Okay, let's do it. Bye. Bye. (laughs) On December 14th, 1992, tragedy struck this small town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And the ripples of that are still felt to this very day. This week on Criminal Musings, I'm going to be telling that story. This school is a place that is very, very important to me. Great Barrington, Massachusetts is my hometown. I was born here and raised here. So this case is personal for me. Please join us as we delve into the story, learn who the victims were, and honor their memory. You can find Criminal Musings wherever you get your podcasts. Introducing the Capital One Walmart Rewards Card. Earn unlimited 5% back on everything you buy at Walmart online. It's the perfect card for all your family's hints this holiday season. Like 5% back on the air fryer Grandpa told you about when he fell asleep in his chair. Mm, Didn't fry anything. Or 5% back on the laptop your sister had carolers sing to you.